Hi, friend. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Dashan. So there's a lot I'm hoping to talk about today, but I would love to just start with the usual question, which is uh, having you introduce yourself and kind of share your background, your life story in whatever way you want to, at whatever length you'd like to. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Katie. Um, let's see, to put some labels on myself, I'm uh, a contemplative neuroscientist. I've been studying meditation now for about uh, 10 years. And before that, I was a, a vision scientist. So I was studying the way that the visual environment um, is represented in the brain and how we do things like uh, navigate in an environment, recognize faces, recognize objects. Um, even before that, I was looking at the effect of light on serotonin production in the brainstem of the gerbil, which is a sentence that gets less and less interesting as it, as it goes on. Uh, but that's how I got my my start in neuroscience. Um, and I got interested in neuroscience because of meditation. So I first heard of meditation when I was a child. I was watching a documentary about the Beatles, and there's a point in the documentary where the Beatles go to Rishikesh to learn to meditate. And I still remember where I was when I saw that. I, I was like sitting on the floor, looking up at the TV, and I was like, yes, that's the thing. Um, that's the thing I want to do. Hmm. And it could have just been that the clothes were really exciting and brightly colored. I don't know what it was about it, but it was like something in me really responded strongly to that. So ever since then, I tried to learn as much as I could about meditation. Um, and when I was in college, I started college as a chemistry major. And then I went and sat a 10 day Goenka retreat. I'd never meditated before. I just like went off and sat a 10 day Goenka retreat. And when I came back from that retreat, I switched my major into neuroscience um, and changed my priorities to try to understand how are these extraordinary states represented in the brain. And that's what I've been working on ever since. Hmm. During that time, what has your own meditation practice been like? Well, I really believed um, the Goenka folks' story that this is the type of meditation that was taught by the Buddha. If you're doing other practices, you're kind of wasting your time. Um, they say that both explicitly and implicitly, and you have to kind of fill out a survey about whether or not you've done any other practices since your last retreat. So I practiced in that tradition for a long time, and it benefited me in some really big ways. I actually, I, um, I got to sit a couple of retreats with Goenka uh, while he was still around. Wow. And I think I developed a level of discipline and concentration that I probably would not have developed if I had started with a more, um, with a little bit of a gentler technique, let's say. Uh, there were also drawbacks. When I was younger, especially, I had a tendency to be very harsh on myself. And there was a way in which I was able to use the meditation practice as just another way to be harsh on myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably could have twisted any practice into that, but the um, the Goenka style of Vipassana with all of it, you know, there's that strong discipline and that really just, you know, do not generate a single new Sankara. You know, it just made me kind of paranoid all the time about what I was doing with my mind. Um, and I was practicing in Massachusetts also. So I didn't really have a Sangha. I was going to these retreats, but then of my close friend group, there was only one other meditator. And so it wasn't until I moved to California in uh, 2018, I started working with Michael Taft, um, I had all of a sudden a bunch of meditation friends who I could talk about practice with mm -hmm. and the combination of starting to work one on one with a teacher and getting that feedback loop going was huge and having a community of peers who we could kind of um, I've never been able to find a source again for this quote, but uh, I saw this quote once like rocks in a tumbler monks polish one another mm -hmm. in the monastery and there was that real sense in a community of spiritual friends that we were able to advance each other's practice uh, in a container that felt very um, warm and safe. Mm. So those two things really accelerated 
uh, my practice. It made it a, a lot more, a lot more fun. Also. Mm. Yeah. What have you explored since 2018 when you moved to California? Like what's the practice been like since that time? Yeah. So I started, let's see, I've been working with Michael one-on-one -on -one since then. And I've also sat, you know, a couple retreats with other teachers that I sat a retreat at Cochise with Chula Dasa, Daniel Ingram. I did a fire casino retreat. So I've been kind of dabbling in some other practices, but the big, oh, I'll just, I'll tell this story because it's ridiculous. Um, mm. So I was, I was listening to the podcast to Deconstructing Yourself already um, back when I was finishing my PhD. I would walk to lab and home every day. So I was walking like three miles a day and I would just listen to the Kenneth Folk ones because those mm. were the only ones that were out. Mm. And once I finished all three of them, I just went back to the beginning and started again. So I was just listening to the podcast every single day while I was writing my thesis. Wow. Um, because it was the first kind of like, it was a level of depth in the practice discussion that I hadn't really found elsewhere. And I couldn't have those kind of discussions in person. So when I moved to California, I learned that Michael was teaching at what at the time was uh, against the stream. And when I found that out, I just like cleared my whole schedule for the Thursday night sit. And I went there on Thursday and I have never seen him do this since. But what he did that night was a, a body scan like a, he guided a Goenka style body scan. But then at the end, he said, OK, now turn your awareness towards the thing that's doing the body scan. And I'd been doing Goenka practice for years and years and years, and I had never done that. I'd never done that move of turning it back on itself. Mm -hmm. And it was just incredible. Like I had all this momentum of concentration and all this practice doing body scanning. So it didn't take much to just to just whoosh, like turn it back on on itself. And so that was like the moment where uh, my practice kind of jumped into something different. Hmm. And I also knew like, OK, this is the teacher that I, that I want to work with. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. What have you worked on in your relationship with him as a teacher? So um, we do both like one on one practice interviews. I'm also uh now like after after he was sort of my teacher for about two years i started helping out with some of the classes so mm -hmm. i'm a teaching assistant for his class which is called vast sky mind which is kind of for people who they come to the thursday night sits but they want to go a little deeper and vast sky mind does that and then there's also a small class uh called reversing the stack there's two sections of that um and i'm in i'm in both of those sections as the ta so um, so I've gotten to see kind of the full like curriculum of, of what he's teaching. And oh, since from 2018 to now, I've my own practice has moved from more of a narrow kind of rigid focused attention practice to more of an open awareness based um, kind of resting in awareness style practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael's been been really like a, a really invaluable resource in like uh, in making that change. Hmm. Yeah. If you could speak to your past self that was doing Goenka practice in, in anger, <laughs> in great <laughs> intensity, what would you tell yourself about the kind of practice you're doing now? And like, what do you wish she had known as she was starting to discover those practices? I was just thinking about this the other hmm. day. That's a great question. Um, I honestly think that that younger version of myself would have thought what I'm doing now is a bunch of nonsense. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I'm pretty sure like when I was, when I first started, I thought you were doing like hyper-focused concentration to get to enlightenment mm. or you were just wasting your time. Mm. So like anyone who was having any fun at all in their practice, um, anyone who was doing something different from what I was doing with that confidence that you can sort of only have when you're like 20, you know, <laughs> and you do like this is the thing. This Everything is it. Else, yeah. I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> Everyone should be doing exactly this, you know, this uh -huh. is the thing, put it in the tap water kind of thing. And um, so I think there's almost, there's almost nothing right now that I think I could tell myself back. To, I think I would just give her a hug. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> And just tell her like you know all this is optional like you don't actually have to be so mean to yourself oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but i don't know if she would actually hear that right yeah. right <laughs> it can be so stubborn sometimes 
<laughs> and I did, like I said, I did get a lot out of it. Like I had a lot, a lot of discipline hmm. um, and a lot of concentration power, but at the expense of like kind of everything else. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Are there any things that you find yourself telling people as a teacher assistant with Michael? Like things that you find yourself saying again and again or helpful hints that you pass on to people? A lot of people, in my experience, just really want to know that they're doing the practice right. Mm. Um, and most of the time they are, and often with small tweaks, like then they, they can be. And that's that's actually something that would have been nicer when I was younger is to have someone to to really talk about practice with and just have them like give me a little bit of feedback. I think a little tiny bit of feedback can go a long way. And mm-hmm. so one of the things that we're doing in the vast sky mind classes, we're doing these these kind of open open awareness practices um, or say where Michael calls it dropping the ball, which is like a do nothing practice. Hmm. So just every time you notice that you're doing anything at all, you just stop and you end up, if you kind of continuously do that, you end up in a place that's like very spacious, very peaceful, very relaxed. Um, And the failure mode that a lot of people fall into there is they try to do the not doing, you know, Hmm. and then you get in this big loop um, and you could just kind of roll in that for a while. And all you have to do is just it, you explain to someone that's going on and you can almost see them realize as they're talking about it that that's what they're doing and they can mm. just drop it. It's just I think like a lot of the value is really just having someone to talk to about your practice so you can listen to yourself and get some feedback from people who've made like the exact same mistakes that mm-hmm. you're making now and just mm. give like a little bit of a little bit of like, a, oh, not quite that way, just a little bit further this way. Mm. Yeah. So did I understand correctly that when you set out to do scientific research, your interest was in learning about how meditation works uh, in like in the brain, in the physical body? Is that is that right? Yeah. So my line of thinking was that all of these states that are accessible, um, that are sort of extraordinary states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then on another level, these longer kind of longitudinal shifts we see like Back then, I was very interested in, in enlightenment, and mm. um, and there, there, those things. This is my twenty-year-old thinking. Um, those things have to be reflected in the brain in some way, and we must be able to to pick them up. Mm-hmm. And in much the same way that my thinking about meditation at the time was like, if enlightenment is real, why would I spend any time pursuing anything else? Mm. Kind of like a like a Pascal's wager, but like with your with your time, you know. Um, I had the same sense about um, about neuroscience. Like if if enlightenment is real, and like here I am on Earth and I have to do something with myself, um, this seems like the best thing to do <laughs> is just to like try to understand this in the brain. <laughs> and I'm glad I made that decision because. It has been, it's been a great adventure so Mm. far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you still see things with the same frame that you had at the beginning or have things changed in terms of how you see things? Well, luckily for Uh me, uh, many things have changed. Uh 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 (laughs) Um, And I think, I think just the general trajectory has been an expansion of um, both a sense of what's possible and also of what, can be true. Mm-hmm. So I think when I was younger, I was a very rigid materialist. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of humbleness that's incorporated into that view as time has gone on. You know, mm. there was astronomy before the telescope, and there were germs before the microscope. And there are things about the brain that we don't understand now because we don't have the tools to look at them Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that they're not there and that's been that's been like a major shift in Mm -hmm. my thinking uh as i've as i've kind of gotten further along the Mm -hmm. the path yeah any specific uh causes of that shift that you recall well some are just first person experience like i've had 
some experiences on retreat or with teachers, particularly, I don't know if you follow the realization process uh, folks at all. No, I don't think I know about them. I haven't done too much with them, but it's uh, Judith Blackstone invented this technique. She was a dancer and then she got a spinal injury and she was stuck in bed for like two years. Hmm. Um, And she developed this technique when, uh, during that time. And a friend and I were recently talking about it and it's kind of an embodiment practice that changed the way that we thought about the word embodiment. Mm. Um, It's like a deep embodiment. Hmm. And what the teachers do are, is a kind of pointing out instruction, but in the body. And so I've had a few interactions with teachers there that I have not been able to figure out the channel on which they're receiving information. Like my best guess would be sort of body language or something. But in my own experience, like I wasn't emitting a lot of body language, but they were still able to kind of tell like where my focus was in my body. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've had some experiences like that, which is just like, I can think of ways that I would try to measure this, but there isn't a current kind of pat theory that explains how this is working you know like kind of parasympathetic like co-regulation body language feedback tone of voice like that that kind of thing those are all things you could test but right now we don't have a way for her for like the teacher to have known like oh no move your attention like an inch lower in your shoulder okay yep there that's where it goes Hmm. like that there there's no there's no scientific explanation for that stuff yet Hmm. yeah so experiences like that um I think they just, it's important that science doesn't just become adhered to the way a religion is adhered to. Like science is a method and we find the edge of knowledge and then we find ways to expand it. And the whole point of doing science is to go out into the unknown and then try to translate it into the known in a way that's kind of lightly held. Um, and. So just writing off kind of peak experiences because there's no scientific explanation for them is actually like, I think, antithetical to the true goals of science. Hmm. Yeah. It makes sense that some of that shift would come from first person experiences. Um, Was there anything like within your career as a researcher that caused that shift as well? Oh, well, there's not, there's not one thing I can point to, mm-hmm. um, but I will say that as my research career has gone on, I have become more humble. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Doing, doing really good science is really challenging. Mm-hmm. And if you can design a solid experiment and get some good data out of it and share it with the community, like that's a great success. Mm-hmm. And I think when I was younger, I was kind of more of a snob. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. And as I've, as I've gone on, uh, my attitude towards other um, researchers and towards other projects tends to be like, okay, cool. Like, what did we learn here? What can we use? Um, and there's, there's an attitude that a lot of young scientists have of approaching new work and new research is like, well, how can I, how can I kind of tear this apart? Mm. Um, and as I've kind of gone on, my attitude has shifted to be like, what can we build from this? How, how is this useful? That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about sort of your career with research. And I think it'd be useful to start with, I'd love to hear you describe what exactly your training to become a scientific researcher on these topics looks like. Like, what did you have to learn? What did you study? What did your sort of apprenticeship in science look like? Can you tell me about that? Sure. This is a this is a long story. So uh-huh. Please. Um, so when I was an undergrad, I was very lucky to be I went to UMass Amherst for mm. undergrad and UMass Amherst had an excellent neuroscience program. Um, and at the time, it was one of the only undergrad neuroscience programs. Mm. Um, so I was really lucky. It was an extraordinary uh, coincidence that I ended up deciding to study neuroscience at a place that had a really good program. So I was lucky enough to have a friend who was already in a research lab. And um, I took an honors class with the professor and got the the highest grade in that class. So Mm -hmm. she invited me to uh, be in a paid position in, in her lab to do research. And once I was in one lab, um, 
I started going to lectures and met a bunch of grad students and I was kind of in the community, you know, and I was like, um, not an expert in anything. I was, I mean, I was like dropping lab equipment. Like we were, so we, uh, well, this was a gerbil lab. Uh, this Uh is also where I learned that I didn't want to do animal work Mm -hmm. and then I forgot later and did it again and then learned it again. But, um, so we were working with gerbils. We were exposing them to different lighting conditions. And then we were looking at how that affected serotonin, um, which has implications for the seasonal affect disorder. Mm. So we would have to sacrifice the gerbils and then we would um, slice their brains and then we would stain uh, cells and determine um, like serotonin concentration in different parts of the brain. And that took two seconds to explain, but it would actually take three days to, to do. Like it was a whole process. Um, and you have to uh, go through all these steps where you're kind of amplifying the signal and then you're attaching a dye to the amplifiers. This is called uh, histology. And yeah, the very first time I did a histological experiment, I like dropped like three things and like broke glass. And like, luckily all the like actual brain tissue was okay. But it was like, I learned very early that histology was not my thing and like animal work was not my thing. Um, so I pretty quickly switched into a human lab where we were studying attention. Hmm. And that's where I really started to hit my stride. I worked with a programmer who um, ended up going on to work for Bethesda. So he like worked on Skyrim and stuff. Um, And we developed a task together that would measure how attention moves um, when there are several objects in the field of view. So, you know, crossing a New York City street or something and you're trying to track your friend who's far away from you and how does how does the brain do that? So we were basically having people play kind of very simple video games and um, drawing conclusions about what their attentional system was doing based on their reaction times. And in that lab, that's around when I started taking grad classes when I was an undergrad. So I was taking like grad level neuro and philosophy classes and um, started actually writing manuscripts. So I got a little bit more Um, into the world of science and I honestly felt like I'd found like a secret door into heaven Mm -hmm. Um, like I didn't I didn't really know what adults were supposed to do like when I was a kid I always thought like maybe later I'll like have a bookstore like I didn't know what like a job was Um, and then like my last year of college I realized there are these positions called research assistant positions and you can actually like do this as a job and it just hadn't occurred to me that that was possible and it was a very sort of idealistic view of science but also there are elements of that that are true like you really do get to trade in ideas and um part of the exciting part of it too was that i got to sort of combine a lot of different skill sets like i got to do a little bit of programming i got to do some graphic design for figures i got to do some writing i got to bring some creativity out in experimental design so it was kind of like i could bring my whole self to the table and um push my own kind of limits while also trying to find like the limits of knowledge and try to push those out too so i was super on board um but i was getting frustrated by the fact that we were trying to draw conclusions about what the brain was doing from only behavioral data. Um, And so I found a bunch of researchers who were doing fMRI and I just cold emailed them all and said, hi, I want to learn how to do fMRI. Um, And one wrote back and said, oh, I actually like, uh, I've been thinking of hiring a research assistant. Why don't you come in and interview? And we got in this big, long kind of discussion about what a particular part of the brain did. Hmm. Uh, And that, I guess, was impressive or something. So he ended up hiring me. And that's how I ended up working. Um, That was Roger Tutel, who has done some of the kind of foundational work on mapping uh, early visual cortex. Hmm. And I didn't know at the time because I didn't know anything about fMRI other than I wanted to do it and I wanted to understand how the brain worked. But Roger was at the center um, in Massachusetts where fMRI was invented. Hmm. Uh, And all the people were still there. So I got to learn how to do fMRI from the people who had kind of been there at the beginning and um, who were still 
uh, like really deeply understood how how it worked. So if I had a technical question, I could go ask like uh, a physicist, you know, why does it work this way? Or if I wanted to know um, what a particular part of the analysis was doing, I could go ask the person who wrote it. Uh, and it was just, I was extraordinarily lucky to be in that place at that time. And also, Roger was, um, he was half at the center, which is now called the Martino Center. Um, he was half time there and half time at the National Institutes of Health. And when I first started, there were no other research assistants in the lab. So rather than go to my peers and kind of figure out uh, stuff all together, Roger would just connect me with these like really high level people. And it was intimidating as heck. I felt like an idiot like most of the time, uh, but I learned a, a lot and I just learned like, okay, I can ask questions and, and get them answered. And that was the kind of transition from me being sort of on the periphery of labs, like as an undergrad, just someone sort of tells you what to do and you kind of do it. Mm -hmm. um, to taking some ownership of my own projects. And because of that, I think I still think in the language of fMRI. So now I've been doing fMRI for a while. And when I design a new experiment or when I have like a question about the brain, that question often just comes to me in the form of an fMRI experiment. Hmm. So that's that's a little bit from the from the beginning. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Uh... I imagine that's like, from what you've said, like sort of like 40% and like what, what, what happened after that? Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so we did, we did a bunch of stuff that was really fun mm -hmm. kind of in those early days. And one of the things we were doing was comparative vision experiments. So we were looking at how um, like face and scene perception works in the brain. The commonly accepted theory at the time was that we have specialized modules for processing these different categories of visual input. Um, and we were able to reduce uh, those high level categories to lower level visual um, uh, qualities. So we were able to drive the face area with low spatial frequency checkerboards and the scene area with high spatial frequency checkerboards. And that's like a very dorky inside baseball thing, but it was just fun. It was just mm. fun to do. Um, and what we would do is we would design an experiment and we would run it in six humans and two rhesus macaques. Hmm. Um, and that way we could see, okay, this is how this is working in humans. This is how it's working in monkeys. So we can draw some kind of evolutionary conclusions from comparing those two brains. Hmm. And because we were working across humans and macaques, um, there was another professor around the Martino Center at the time who was Belgian and he was um, moving back to Belgium to restart his lab there and asked if I wanted to go to Belgium and help start his lab. So I was in the middle of, I'd actually been accepted at that point to a bunch of um, PhD programs and had told one that I was going to go and I had to call them and say like, actually, I. <laughs> I can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just such a cool opportunity, mm -hmm. especially doing neuroscience in Boston. I was the only American in my research group. Everyone had come from everywhere to do mm -hmm. research in this place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like kind of a bumpkin. I was like, yeah, I'm from, you know, 20 minutes from here. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And I'd lived in Massachusetts my entire life at that point. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to go do something different was really appealing. Mm -hmm. um, so I did uh, research on macaques in Belgium for a year. Um, we were doing we were doing brain stimulation. So we would um, we had electrodes that we'd implant in cortex, and then we would run current through those electrodes in order to bias. The, um, the monkey's attention to different parts of the visual field. Hmm. So, so we were doing sort of BCI um, pretty early, and there were myriad challenges. So, I mean, it was just that was actually just to give you a sense of like my personality at the time. That's one, why I wanted to do macaque research was it was the hardest thing. Hmm. It was the hardest thing okay. to do. So <laughs> that's why I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and after about a year. I did. I decided to to leave um, mainly because 
I wanted to understand attention in human cortex, in human brains, and I realized that there were simpler, more direct ways to understand attention in humans, uh, like by like by working with humans. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think there is still, there's a lot of value in the information that we learned from macaque researchers, but I also just learned personally it, it, it wasn't from me. <laughs> like, you sort of had, you have your own monkeys and you really bond with them and they're like, you know, they're kept in, in captivity mm. and they could they could be having like little monkey lives, you know. Mm. Um, and particularly in the context of the questions I wanted to ask, you know, this whole time I'm like meditating every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm like going to work as a neuroscientist. And it was a little bit more difficult back then to merge those two worlds. Mm -hmm. um, people still like kind of thought you were in a cult maybe if you had a meditation practice. Mm. Um, Meditation was like a little bit behind, you know, yoga in, in that way where that uh -huh. became like mainstream a little sooner. So, but I was still in the back of my mind, like really interested in kind of bringing those worlds closer together. And um, after I got back from Belgium, I did some, um, I did some work with Moshe Bar, looking at contextual processing, predictive processing. Uh, we put together a book at the time called Predictions in the Brain. And if you look at that book, I'm in the acknowledgments section mm. of it, um, and started thinking about these kind of questions, like how do our expectations and context bias our experience? Um, so I started thinking about that more, and the way that it appeared to me that made sense to merge meditation and neuroscience was to go through uh, the door of attention because mm. both um, both are you know operating on attention mm. and I've been interested in attention for almost as long as I've been interested in meditation because um, you know all of our experience is determined by what we pay attention to and what we pay attention to is determined by our expectations and so if we can change those expectations, we can actually change our entire experience. Hmm. And I got really interested in, in how that works. So for my PhD, um, I went to do a lit review of the way that meditation changes attention systems in the brain hmm. because I hadn't looked into it and I figured there must be like mountains of papers uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so I like searched and there, yeah you can see where this is going there was nothing there was nothing there <laughs> and so what this, year would that have been that you were working so this on was in um, early 2011 okay. so what I didn't know is that like Judd's uh, paper on default mode network and in meditators was about to come out it came mm. out like nine Nine months later or something um, and uh, there were a couple other papers Julie Brzezinski Lewis's paper came out shortly after that um, but at the time there wasn't anything so I went to my uh, advisor David Summers who is at Boston University um, and told him this I was like look you know here's this giant behavioral literature from the 80s showing uh, Dan Brown actually published some of those papers and Valentine and Sweet is a big one, um, showing that basically meditators do better at any kind of attention task you throw at them. But these are all like pencil and paper attention tasks or uh, one of the papers was using like an actual tachistoscope, which is this super old school mode of visual presentation. Here's this whole behavioral literature. They're doing better on attention tasks and no one has looked at that in the scanner mm -hmm. um and here i was with like now at this point like quite a bit of experience looking at visual attention in the scanner and in a lab where there were also like several tasks designed to measure visual attention in the scanner um and so the idea was like look let's just take a bunch of people who have meditation experience and let's not have them meditate in the scanner mm -hmm. um, because who knows what they're actually doing in their practice. This at the time, this is this is all I'm still looking at. Um, you know, Burmese vipassana meditators, and you could be doing several different things when you're actually sitting down. So let's not look at the kind of state change, but let's look at trait level changes of having a practice by looking at the effect on attention networks in the brain. Hmm. And 
David was great. Like he he was my PhD advisor. I was um, working on a project that was looking at capacity limitations in working memory versus attentional systems because they're both capacity limited. And we, I think, still don't understand whether that's drawing on the same resource or not. That's like an active debate. So I was going to do that project. And I think David could clearly see that I was much more excited about this. Um, and he said, well, you know, write a grant. And if you get the grant, let's do it. So that's what I did. I wrote a grant. I got the grant. Um, and then David kind of connected me with um, Kathy Kerr, uh, who is no longer with us, but she was an amazing resource at the beginning of the project. Um, and Chris Moore, and then I reached out to Sarah Lazar. And so we had um, some meetings and we had a little team, and, um, and then I was underway studying meditation. And it was just like, that was a real inflection point for me, um, where I realized like if I get really clear on what I wanna do, it's possible like the limit is actually my ability to imagine and to figure out what I want to do like mm. otherwise it's it's pod like there's a there's going to be a way and so to recruit recruit meditators I just kind of I pitched the project to a lot of different meditators and I got told no like by a lot of them and I just kept trying different ways until I got one person to say yes and then that person helped me recruit more more people mm. and so in the end, we had, I think, yeah, it was 16 meditators and controls doing attention tasks uh, in the scanner. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What did you find from that study? There were a couple of things that are interesting. One is in terms of the design. Another is in terms of um, biomarkers for meditating brains. So hmm. the study was cross-sectional not longitudinal. So each meditator had their own matched control. Can you explain that uh, for like a layperson? I'm not sure yeah. I understand. Yeah, totally. So like a longitudinal study is uh, done over time. So mm -hmm. say you take like, you, you would take a big group of people and they've all never meditated, but they want to learn. And then you measure them, say, every three months as they like develop their meditation practice. So you Maybe for a, years or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have a baseline data point and then you can watch the trajectory of improvement or 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 disintegration <laughs> depending on uh what you're looking at over over time <laughs> um so there you have and typically you know like a like a art like a randomized control trial is this uh type of design where you're looking at you have an active group and a control group and you're looking at them over time um in a cross-sectional study you it's you do that if a longitudinal study isn't possible or feasible so here i recruited people who had a a good amount of meditation experience and um, compared them to a group of people who had never meditated before. And the idea is you want the groups to be as similar as possible and to be only differing on the variable that you're interested in. Of course, that's not always possible because human beings are, you know, infinitely variable. But for, for this study, um, we did several things to try to make the groups as equal as possible. We matched them on on five demographic factors, but I think the most important thing was we um, there's been there's been some evidence that people will do as well in a study as you expect them to. Hmm. So hmm. if you give people a big long questionnaire, um, asking them all about their meditation experience, and then you give them an attention task there's an implicit knowledge on their part that they're supposed to do well on this task. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, um, a lot of meditation studies weren't controlling for that necessarily. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we recruited each control subject for each meditator. They had, uh, let's see, they were the same um, age, gender, uh, level of education, they had the same number of languages natively spoken because wow. the bilingual brain is, is in some ways different from the monolingual brain. Um, and there were a couple other factors we matched them on. But most importantly, we asked them, each control, we asked them to rate on a scale from one to five how good they were at doing several different things, mm -hmm. uh, swimming, driving. Everyone was above average at driving. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a bunch of other bunch of other things and then whatever they said and we also had fill in the blank so they would have to have like a five out of five on something hmm. and whatever they gave themselves a five on 
we gave them the exact demographic questionnaire we gave the meditators just with their thing swapped in. So they okay. had to answer about swimming or something. So we set up the exact same expectation of high performance in the controls huh. and in the meditators. Interesting. We, yeah, we called it recruitment based on sham expertise. Okay. Because uh, they, they were supposed to be, yeah, they're supposedly being recruited because they're swimming experts uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, or whatever their thing was. Uh -huh. And we were one of the first studies that didn't see a behavioral difference between the meditators and the controls. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So the um, meditators and the controls did exactly the same on the sustained attention task. They did um, exactly the same on the attention capture task. However, their brains looked different while wow. they were doing the tasks. Yeah. Um, so that's the interesting kind of biomarker. Uh, the meditators when they were supposed to be paying attention, were activating attention networks and suppressing the default mode network more than the non-meditators. Mm -hmm. And when we compared also during resting state, which is a task-free state, so you just kind of sit there, um, the meditators were also suppressing default mode network more than both our group of matched controls and a group of um, 400 subjects that we pulled out of a database. Hmm. So that's a further line of evidence that it seems like one of the best biomarkers we have right now um, to classify meditators from non-meditators seems to be this ratio of activity in default mode network versus attention networks at rest. Hmm. It's not a very nuanced metric, but it does seem reliable across a lot of different studies. And I think there's there's more to learn there and there's further to, to go, but there's there's something interesting that's embedded in that signal. Hmm. Yeah. What year did you finish that study and, and what's kind of happened since then? Yeah, so when did it, I think that paper came out two years ago. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's online if you look at my Google Scholar. So this stuff that really takes a while. <laughs> Yes. I mean, I started collecting data for that project in 2013 and wow. the paper came out two years ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. This stuff does take a while. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and now my research interests are kind of following my practice interests. Um, so one other thing I got very interested in during my PhD was predictions and um, prediction updating. So there's a, a cortical signal of uh, an unexpected event. It's called the P300. And um, you get a P300 when you have some expectation about the environment that is then not borne out by the environment. Hmm. Um, you get this kind of wide ranging update signal. And it seems to be the signal to say like, okay, everything stop and we need to just absorb the environment right now so that we can then assimilate it into future predictions. Um, and I got really interested in that and how that works and where it is in the brain and how meditation changes that. Um, my theory is that meditators should be holding, holding like uh, those predictions a little bit more lightly. Hmm. Um, and I have, I have several reasons for that. Uh, but because I got interested in that, um, I spent a while looking at the temporal parietal junction, which is a part of the brain that is uh, highly variable, both from between macaques and humans, so it's evolutionarily um, newer, uh, and highly variable from human to human. Hmm. And um, if you don't have a TPJ, you don't emit a P300. So it seems important for, that's a paper from, uh, it's a Klein et al. from the 70s, late 70s, um, it's stroke patients. So there's something interesting happening with the temporal parietal junction prediction updating. And in our paper, we also saw, um, I gave the meditators what's called an oddball task, which is when you have just uh, the you basically create an unpredictable environment to induce these types of responses. Hmm. And there was a trend that the meditators were showing much less reactivity in TPJ to oddballs than the non-meditators. So I think there's, there's something interesting happening there. And in parallel, 
in my own practice, I've gotten uh, much more interested in these open awareness practices as opposed to focused attention practices. And so my research questions have kind of evolved um, as my practice has evolved. Oh, I should mention I did like a I did like a two year detour into brain stimulation uh, for my postdoc. So I did like a um, you know, first in human clinical trial of a new type of brain stimulation, which uses electric fields uh, to modulate deep brain structures uh, without affecting the cortical surface. So. I wanted to learn that because I'm interested in how to potentially use brain stimulation as an augmentation of meditation teaching. Um, so I wanted to make sure I knew how to do that. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So that's my entire research biography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. It's it's a it's a privilege to hear all that. Yeah, uh, I've never actually like talked about this uh, uh -huh. all the way through before, so mm. that was that, that was fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's on record too, so <laughs> it's great. Uh, and it's the hi history so far. So I'm curious to ask about the future. But I, I wonder before I do that, um, let me. I'm just trying to think how to ask this question. So obviously scientific research in general is ongoing and certainly for meditation in particular but like given what you know as a researcher at this point in time how do you interpret from a, a scientific perspective what meditation is if i have to describe meditation <laughs> to clinicians, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the way I describe it is it's a mechanism by which the brain can change itself. Mm -hmm. um, we have the sort of standard definition in the field, which is John Kabat-Zinn's uh, meditation is paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally to what's happening in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Um, that's off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure that's pretty close to John Kabat-Zinn's uh, definition. So that's the scientific definition that gets kind of bandied about. Um, but the the way that the way that I tend to define this in in research circles is that it seems to be a way that uh, the the mind can change the brain or the brain can change itself. Hmm. Yeah. And what kinds of changes, broadly speaking, do you does science the, in, in its current state understand? meditation sure. to be having some of the earliest work or actually probably the earliest work on this was done by Sarah Lazar who's mm. at Harvard Medical School and she looked at anatomical changes in the brains of meditators um, and this was in the late 90s so F MRI like fMRI had been around for like a, just a couple years at this mm. point and she was already putting meditators into the scanners wow. Sarah's amazing mm. um, and she found that so okay it, it's well known that as we age the cortex gets thinner so age-related cortical thinning it's a thing it happens to everybody uh and sarah found that the rate of cortical thinning was slower in meditators than in non-meditators hmm. um and so another way to put that is that uh meditating brains look younger than they are hmm. um and that was concentrated in a couple areas of the brain. I think the insula and the TPJ were two of them, which is interesting because those structures are implicated in, in meditation, I think. Um, you know, interoception, prediction updating. So that was like one of the earliest findings. And that's been replicated a couple of times. There have been a lot of studies um, with both fMRI and EEG of different um, meditation states and one thing that's a little bit tricky about that is it's difficult to compare across them because how do you compare, you know, an EEG study of Zen meditators to an fMRI study of mantra meditators, you know? And the field is early on enough 
that there isn't yet, and this gets into the future stuff, like there isn't yet consensus on, okay, here are the like high level processes that are changing as a result of a meditation practice. We're still kind of looking around for what those are, other than um, this default mode network being more suppressed, less active, more deactivated, however you want to put it, in meditators seems to be a finding that's holding up across several different labs. So the kind of stuff Judd Brewer was doing with the PCC deactivation, the stuff I saw in the Burmese Vipassana meditators during attention tasks, um, the stuff that Jay and Shinzen are doing now with deactivating PCC, um, and kind of across the board, many others have found that there's just less overall default mode network activity in meditators than in non-meditators. Um, what does PCC stand for? Oh, sorry, the posterior cingulate cortex. Mm. So that's just one node of the whole default mode network. Mm. Yeah. And I've definitely heard of this before and read things about it, but how would you, from your vantage point, describe what the default mode network is? Sure. So when I have to describe it to lay people, I often start by saying it's kind of the operating system of a self. Mm. Um, so the default mode network is involved in um, remembering the past, projecting into the future, and a bunch of other things that the brain does when it's idling, like uh, monitoring for motion in the periphery. Um, there are several other processes. And it's called the default mode network because uh, if you don't give people anything to do, this is what they default to doing. Um, and if you check in with your own experience, that will probably track, you know, thinking about the past, thinking about the future. Um, and so that, and there's, yeah, it's a set of cortical areas that um, seem to be related with these sort of interior thought processes. And it's active when there's nothing to do, and then it deactivates when you need to direct attention um, out into the environment. So all of that, like everything I've said so far is pretty much um, field consensus. And then um, just to sort of depart from field consensus, this is something I, this is kind of my framework for it, um, bringing in the predictive uh, element. Think the reason that the default mode network is, is churning like this, is kind of synthesizing the past and the future, um, I think it's basically running simulations in order to generate more fine-tuned predictions that then will come up when you're in a context where that prediction is relevant. So we're basically taking in experience all the time. We're using that experience to generate predictions about what is likely to occur or not occur in the environment that we're in. And when one of those predictions is not borne out, we stop what we're doing, incorporate new information, and then when we have a moment to go back into sort of default thinking, we incorporate that new information into future predictions. Mm. So that's my kind of slightly bonkers theory about what default mode network is doing. Mm. I mean, I like hearing it from your perspective <laughs> in addition to the kind of general state of the field. Um, again, sort of still staying in the like current status quo before we go to the future, like how is the field dealing with the varieties of meditation practice? You basically just share in your method section what what you're doing, how you're recruiting, and who you're studying. Mm. So there are sort of two tracks that are happening now. There's the clinical track where it's like, okay, how does meditation affect depression? How does it affect anxiety? How does it affect PTSD? You know, like take, take meditation and apply it to um, a clinical syndrome to get people back to being well. And Typically, the standard intervention there is mindfulness-based stress reduction. So um, that's an eight-week program. It was developed by John Kabat-Zinn at UMass Worcester. Um, and it is, I think, 20 minutes a day of meditation and uh, seems to really help. It was originally developed for people who were in uh, a lot of pain and helped them with pain. So that has become the sort of standard clinical intervention is you take your groups, you give one MBSR, you put others in a book club or something, and then you measure the outcome. Mm -hmm. So there's one whole track that's doing MBSR. And um, then there's another track who are recruiting 
either from their own kind of networks or going into meditation centers and pulling people into studies. Hmm. So those are more variable. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, let's see, the first author is uh, Poppy Schnoring, I think. The, um, the Dan Brown Sangha, like EEG paper, you know, they recruited from the Sangha um, for that paper. And for my fMRI study, like I snowball recruited out of one sangha. I just got one person and then they recruited more people and then they recruited more people. So partially it's a challenge of just finding people to come in and be mm -hmm. part of your study. Partially it's just um, you recruit who you're close to already. Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to find a group of meditators who are all doing the same thing, typically you do want to be recruiting out of one or very few sanghas to do that. Mm -hmm. So the way that that gets reported out is you just, yeah, you basically just detail it in your method section. You talk about what your recruitment criteria were, how you evaluated your potential participants. Um, you know, some people just put up flyers. And mm -hmm. so then this is probably less common now than it was like 10 years ago. Um, but like 10 years ago, you would flyer. And so you see some method sections that are like, OK, we had three Zen people. We had like some mantra folks, that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are sometimes some studies that are just like super across different techniques. That's less common now. Now mm -hmm. you're more likely to get a kind of narrower sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, that that's super interesting. And I'm glad you answered that. And I think maybe I, I phrased the question wrongly. So let me think okay. of a different way to put it. Um, I mean, I, I often, you know, from kind of like a practice and instruction perspective, think of meditation as like, like a lot of problems or points that teachers would want to make can be kind of translated into the metaphor of like movement practices of like, for example, um, you know, there's yoga and kettlebell and weightlifting and all these different kinds of movement practices. And those have different effects on the body and different advantages and different risks and so on. And um, sure. so I'm wondering, like, within contemporary neuroscientific research on meditation, like if there are really these different techniques and different traditions and presu presumably, you know, for, even from the research I've seen, they're aware of like, oh, um, these have very radically different effects on the brain based on what kind of method you do. Like, how do they think about that and describe what's happening there? Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, the general research consensus is that there are three bins that you can put meditation mm, in. Okay, interesting. Yeah. There's uh, focused attention, open monitoring, and your favorite, Kashin, uh -huh. loving kindness. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's all that's all there is. <laughs> and so you put your you put your practice into one of those it three. It kind bins. of feels like Catholic, Protestant, and like Baptist or something. Like, <laughs> like you get one of these. Anyway, please continue. And so it's funny because I've actually heard Burmese Vipassana de described as both focused attention and open monitoring, which okay. you can make a case sort of either way. Uh -huh. And then, of course, you're doing metta on those retreats also. Uh -huh. So you're doing all all three. Right. Um, so for the, for the, yeah. So those are the three kind of like academic categories that hmm. get kind of thrown around. That's uh, Anton Lutz came up with that originally. Um, and it's been sort of adopted by the field because you need, you need some sort of, you need some sort of classification system to be able to make progress. Um, I don't think that classification system will hold up forever because, of course, like even when I was giving talks about this, you know, six years ago, I was saying, of course, each of these practices has elements of the other practices. And you can't do your metta practice if you're not concentrated, you know. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, Burmese Vipassana can be like either focused attention or an open monitoring. Hmm. But those are the bins that practice gets put into. Gets put into. We're not far along enough to have a nice solid taxonomy of like here. And this is getting into future stuff. Here's what this type of practice does. Here's what it changes in the psychological system. Here's what it changes in the biological system. And here are the sort of benefits and side effects of those. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that classification, that taxonomy yet. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of groups who are looking into, you know, people who have difficult experiences with meditation. But I just I just can't emphasize enough, like until until like 
a few years ago, you couldn't really get funding to study this stuff at mm. all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my whole grant uh, was about attention training. Um, and I was defining meditation as attention training and then presenting it as an attention training method. Um, and like Amishi Ja, who's in Florida, she told me at her job talk, like she studies meditation, but at her job talk, she just talked about attention and attention training. Um, so we're still in the very early days of it even being like within the Overton window of biology to be talking about this stuff. Mm, mm. Um, and because of that, I mean, it's a pro and a con. The con is that we don't totally understand what the final common pathways are of practice. Are different practices affecting different parts of the brain in different ways, different parts of the psychology in different ways? We sort of know that, but like, how do we measure that? Um, but at the same time, there's like a whole generation of researchers now who don't have to fight politically to be able to do these studies, which was not the case uh, like a decade ago. So I think we're going to see a real explosion in understanding of both both meditation and and psychedelics. That's another like uh, research area that's like really flourishing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's so much low hanging fruit in these areas um to be to be understood yeah mm -hmm. within that kind of categorization system of those three categories what's like in brief kind of the understanding of what affects those different things methods will have on meditators we don't really know so mm -hmm. particularly biologically like mm -hmm. you can look at um the different systems that should be involved in like doing these different practices. Like uh, Gael Desbordos uh, tried to look at focused attention versus loving kindness mm -hmm. and how that um, affected the amygdala in response to highly emotional images. And if I remember correctly, she found only um, she saw a cortical effect in TPJ, which I mm. thought was very interesting. Um, but I don't think she saw amygdala differences between the two practices. Don't quote me on that, but I can put, I don't know if you have show notes, but I could put that paper in the show notes. Sure. So there are a couple people now who are trying to sort of compare directly between different practices to try to look at um, what changes and how they're different. But this is like an area that's really ripe for future mm. study. Yeah. So even at that categorization level system, there's no like broad, um, like very basic strokes consensus about the kinds of effects that those practices will have. No, there's okay. theoretical stuff um, uh -huh. and there's people looking in, in different parts of the brain, but there's no like, yeah, this this is the set of areas that we are positive are affected by focused attention mm -hmm. meditation. These are the set of areas that are definitely focused by open monitoring. And then not many people are studying the Brahma Viharas. Uh -huh. um, there, yeah, uh, right. there are a couple labs, but there aren't there aren't that many. Hmm. Yeah. I'm glad you I mean, know that this is something I've been thinking about recently. But like, I would love to know historically why this is the case. I, I have guesses. But I mean, it's interesting that sort of the, the um, uh, cultural focus has been on meta in particular. And certainly, you know, I've, I've like played into that. I like brand things about meta, but, you know, yeah. increasingly really interested in the Brahma Viharas as a whole. And, um, and it also, um, I mean, you know, so I'll, I'll get back to you in a second, but like part, part of, you know, I'm, I'm almost sort of having like an allergic reaction to this like three category system because <laughs> my, my own subjective experience with these sort of things is increasingly so strange so category defying and so um blurry mm -hmm. and, and and idiosyncratic that it's like the the kinds of things that seem useful to do in my own mind are like increasingly things no one told me to do that i've never heard instructions for that's like connecting dots like maybe maybe there are pieces that i've heard here or there but then they connect in weird ways mm -hmm. and it's like oh well this seems to be working so i'll keep doing this and uh that's great like i love it, it, it subjectively it's like oh my my whole experience is like a playground like i can do whatever i want on this playground uh if it seems fun if it seems enjoyable if it decreases my suffering if it's helping me help other people like this is great um but like uh if you gave me that three categorization system, it's like, what do you do? I'd be like, mm, yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> more, other, all, you know, like, um, uh, so, um, no, but I mean, you know, I, I, that's sort of like within the realm of like one, a practitioner and two, like a highly idiosyncratic practitioner, like way outside, you know, um, 
but um, I'm curious, like, yeah, again, sort of postponing the future thing, bridging into it, how, like, if you could just um, uh, clear the slates and say, okay, we're not doing this three category thing anymore. Uh -huh. How would you okay. start to set up something new? Like, I mean, you know, you don't have to have a whole like periodic table yet or something, but just like, what would your hunches be about a better categorization system? Oh, wow. That's real. that's super fun. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> just any guesses you have or like inklings or any, anything along those lines yeah, would be great. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to think out loud about this because I have, you know, I really like doing experiments. Like I'm an experimentalist in that way. So mm -hmm. I haven't tried to write like a high level position paper on like, here's how we could recategorize all this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so I don't like have like a boilerplate for this. Um, one of the things just off the top of my head that seems to me to be something that's changed in my practice, and I see this in a lot of students too, is how much agency you have in your practice. Oh, beautifully so, said. Yeah. And kind of like any other creative practice, you you sort of learn the basics and you nail those and then you start playing, mm. you know. And that seems to be an interesting like developmental trajectory that you could track. So it's not a bin, but it's a spectrum of mm. like, what are you what are you doing when you sit down? And are you following a script out of um, like in a way that's kind of rote, or are you stepping back and um, kind of playing around with with what's happening in your experience? So there's like one spectrum. Another spectrum that I think um, you would probably see interesting things along would be how narrow or wide is your attentional aperture while you're practicing? Are you um, taking one part of the field of awareness and boosting the signal from that while suppressing the signal from the rest of the field? Or like that seems like that's sort of one end of a spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum, there's, um, are you, this is gonna be imperfectly put, but are you kind of taking the field of awareness as object? And of course, there's no you in that to be taking anything as object, but are you kind of dissolving the perceiver into the perceived and then just like allowing whatever's happening to be happening. And that seems like, again, it's not a bin, but it's a spectrum. And it's not like this is better than this. It's just that there are two very different ways of practicing. And I think you would see you know, very interesting things um, in the brain along that spectrum mm -hmm. and I mean I've actually done a little bit of like pilot stuff with with that mm. um, and so so there's two like amount of agency and how much of the sort of sensorium is available to you or is like the object of practice mm. and it seems like we could start doing even with just that like that those two axes like that there could be some interesting um, stuff to be discovered there mm. Yeah, and I guess another axis would be like observing versus changing. Um, so there's a whole mode of practice of like non-judgmental awareness. And then there are more directed modes where you're actually kind of generating an experience. Um, right. Yeah, so three axes. Okay, uh, can you say those again, uh, like what those are just in brief? Yeah, so let's just say like the amount of agency you have, like uh, so, or we could put that as like creativity even. Mm -hmm. Um, the aperture of awareness from very tight to infinite, I mm -hmm. guess. And um, the, uh, I guess, like obs the observing versus changing spectrum. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you non-judgmentally just being with whatever's arising on one end all the way to, you know, and you could even put Brahma Vihara practice on this end mm -hmm. um, and like deity yoga and stuff where you're actually like, spinning up an experience, generating it, you know, visualization, that kind of thing. Yeah. And are all those axes, at least some of them you mentioned, like one isn't better than the other, it's just a spectrum. Are all of those, those that quality or some of those like- I, I mean, weighted? I just thought of this. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But I would, I would say, yeah, like there's, I don't think that there 
let's see, do I want to commit to this? Let me just say it right now, mm -hmm. the version of Katie you're getting at this exact moment, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's one practice this, but I mean, obviously, like, don't, you know, your practice just don't club baby seals. Uh -huh. uh, but, sure. but when you like sit down to do your practice, mm -hmm. um, there are going to be like, different things that make sense to be doing at different times, both across mm -hmm. your life and in this like exact moment. Mm -hmm. And there is no one best practice. Sure. Best, yeah. Sure. There's, it's not like in those, say we say we adopt this three axis system forever. Uh -huh. um, sure. It's not like, oh, this is the point right here. Yeah. Like this is it, go. it's optimized. Yeah, totally. no, totally. it's like uh, each individual is gonna move through that space on a trajectory that's, that's theirs, you know? Sure. In the same way, as any creative practice, you know, learning the guitar or learning how to paint, like you get the tools and then you, you make the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. And sorry to put you on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> at least over here on hearing you talk about this, it seems to me like the um, sort of aperture spectrum and the uh, observation creation spectrum would be like neutral in that like, oh, these are, these are all good. And that, but the agency one seems like it would actually be weighted towards like, oh, more agency would be better. Would you disagree with that or? Well, I think eventually, yes. Like you wouldn't want to be sitting for like 40 years and still be following rote instructions. But at the beginning, it can mm -hmm. actually be really good to just get yourself Some out of the equation and, and, and do what the teacher's telling you to do and just really do it. You know right. what I mean? Like just kind of suspend the whole like, oh, but I think, da, 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 you know, and just like put that aside for a second and just follow the instructions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Helpful. Helpful. That can really help. Yeah. <laughs> fair. Fair. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Same as a recipe. Like if you wanted to learn how to roast a chicken, you wouldn't just like take a raw chicken and wing it. You know, uh -huh. you would like learn some stuff. Speak for yourself. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Maybe, maybe there is a whole like crazy wisdom raw chicken yeah. school that I know about. But, yeah. You know, you sort of learn the thing and then you learn like, oh, I actually like a little bit of lemon and, and thyme, you know, mm -hmm. and you kind of play with it. But at the beginning, it makes sense to just to just get the technique down without also having this evaluator in the background, like trying to figure out how to optimize it for your own needs. Like there is a way where and obviously you don't suspend your, you know, your ethical intuition, like your agency, like these things, you know, mm -hmm. in the teacher student relationship. But there is a. a an argument I think to be made for just when you sit down on the cushion, just doing the practice as instructed for a little while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you're, you're being very, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, I, I'm grateful you're indulging my flights of fantasy with my questions because yeah, I cool. imagine this is not the sort of, uh, question you might get in the research environment. So no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So let me give you, I'll give you a, a simpler question and then a harder question. So uh, the simpler question is what's, what's kind of on the docket for the next few years with research? Sure. Um, so I'm in the middle of starting a study. I'm at UC Berkeley in the Center for the Science of Psychedelics, and mm -hmm. I'm running the meditation lab inside of, the, of that center. Um, yeah. And so I'll be doing fMRI of meditation um, and then also collaborating with some people who are doing some studies on psilocybin and also on uh, visual system. So okay. it's really it's like a little it's heaven, basically, uh -huh. it's research heaven for me. Um, and I'm working on two lines of inquiry right now. Um, one is a smaller study that's looking at jhana practice. Uh, and so one of the central claims of jhana practice is that you come out of your jhanas with a more equanimous mind and uh, more focused, more attentive, more able to do any other kind of practice after you do your jhana. So there are a lot of people who, that, you know, they do jhana on their way into like their Dzogchen practice because it stabilizes and calms and pacifies the mind. But that claim hasn't been empirically tested. So uh, I'm working on testing that. So there's a, an attention task called the gradual continuous performance task. And it's basically, in my years of attention work, it's the task I've seen that has the most um, kind of similarity to the way that we use our attention system in the world, hmm. right? Because when you're in the scan, right, you're in a tiny magnet, you're looking at a projection screen, hmm. you're pressing a button, like there's all sorts of things about that environment that are artificial. But this task, 
the um, the stimuli slowly fade from one to the other, and you have to respond to some of them and withhold a response to others. Hmm. And it um, there's been enough work done on it where we understand what a brain that's in the zone looks like when it's doing this task versus out of the zone, hmm. um, which is the actual scientific terminology that the hmm. inventor of the tasks use. Um, so what I'm having people do is they do this uh, gradual continuous performance task, and then they do their jhana practice, and then they do the grad CPT again. Um, so it's a very simple test of this kind of central claim of jhana practice. Does it improve your sustained attention? Um, the other reason to do the attention task is that we then have a baseline for the jhana practice. So when you do fMRI, you can't just say, oh, I want to understand what this particular state looks like in the brain, so let's have people in the scanner in that state. You need a, a baseline, a ground truth to compare it to. So by having an attention task and then having jhana practice, we can compare um, a demanding attentional task of jhana to a demanding attentional task that's much more of like a walking around real world task. Hmm. And then there are some sort of like extra credit parts of that study, like actually looking at differences between the jhanas um, in both a um, sort of a first level analysis way, like what what does the brain look like in each different jhana? I'm only doing the first four because the last four are a little harder to do in the scanner. Um, and then we're looking at um, we're doing some connectome harmonic analysis of the so how does that look in different jhanas? And I have collaborators who are helping me. What's that connectome harmonics? So I can um, send you some papers on it, uh, okay. but the people to look at are um, Morton Kringleback, Celine Adesoy, um, and Fernando Rosas. Mm -hmm. And then some of the um, qualia research folks were doing some of this for a while. Too. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so it's basically like uh, a way to pick up like subtler differences between brain states that wouldn't necessarily be captured by your standard first level fMRI analysis. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have some early results on that. I only have data from one subject. Um, and even though they were explicitly instructed not to, they had a bunch of cessations in there. So now <laughs> I have like cessation data, uh, which I'm looking at too. Um, but what like early results, uh, what it looks like behaviorally is that the attention task does get better following jhana practice. Um, and in the brain, um, there are um, some areas involved in monitoring the state of the body, and those seem to deactivate in, um, in the later jhanas. Hmm. So interesting preliminary results, but I want to run several more subjects before I sort of make any strong claims based on that data. The nice thing about jhana, though, is that it's effectively, <laughs> it's almost like it's, it's, it's like made for fMRI, you know, hmm. you need these blocks where people are doing different things. And with jhana, you have these blocks of each jhana. So, so that's kind of perfect for fMRI. So, so I'm doing a little bit of that. And I started collecting that data back at Harvard. And then I'm going to do some more data collection over here. And the thing I've gotten interested in, in my own um, personal practice, is this kind of like open awareness, like do nothing style practice. And there are different ways of conceptualizing it, but one of the ways of thinking about um, open awareness is what is awareness outside of or mm -hmm. unconstrained by. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a way to model this, and it's not a perfect model, but it's a model where you can do this in four levels. Um, so awareness can first be outside of thought, unconstrained by thought. So this is the these kind of practices where you see thoughts as you know clouds in the sky of awareness. Hmm. Um, and so you can sort of situate the center of gravity of awareness outside of thinking. Um, the second level you can think of as, it's unfortunate that we have to use the words like numbers and levels and stuff, mm. but just like the, uh, the next thing uh, is uh, like personality structure, um, visceral emotional content, reactivity. Uh, there is a possible situation outside of, of that. Um, next, uh, foundational sort of perceptual concepts like 
uh, space and time, these kind of constraints that are often taken for granted, uh, but can be dropped in the perceptual system. Hmm. And you can kind of abide outside of space and time. And then finally, uh, concepts themselves. So you can sort of just be abiding in a conceptual space. Hmm. And so it's a, it's a nice model for like, what, what, it, what can awareness objectify is like one, one way to look at it. And again, you'll notice that there's four conditions and you could do an fMRI experiment on that. Hmm. So hmm. there's um, a, a whole set of people in the world who are able to just kind of jump um, between these different modes uh, and put themselves all the way, you know, into thought and then kind of back out. Um, and it's there, like, it's an interesting study to do. I think it will tell us some cool things about both, like, I'm just curious, first of all, to see what we find. I think it will also give us some really interesting potential teaching tools for future use of, okay, like, <laughs> I keep wanting to slide into the future here. So, but, but the way I'm like looking at this particular study is the beginning of kind of the next phase of my research program, which is really interested in looking at what are the biomarkers of different types of meditation practice, and then how can we use those to supplement, um, teaching tools in order to help the students achieve their own goals. <laughs> so there's a possibility that once we understand these things better, you could, as part of your like initial teacher interview, like you do your teacher interview and then you get a brain scan. And then we talk about what your meditation goals are and then we use all of this information to help you get closer to your goals. And of course your goals are gonna change as you go along um, mm -hmm. and you'll have the freedom to to do that. But right now, we just don't understand um, how the meditating brain is changing, both within a practice and across practices. Like, we don't have those maps yet. So mm. before we can really do anything else, like, we need to just, like, make the maps first. Mm. And I find myself in a position of, of map maker right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That sounds fun. <laughs> uh... Let me ask as well, like, what would you say, as someone that's done extensive fMRI research, what would you say the sort of advantages of fMRI research are and, and the sort of, you know, you alluded to this other, this other modality that sort of looks at other things. What are sort of the limitations of fMRI? Sure. So fMRI is really good in space. We can tell um, to, to a, a pretty high, like, degree where things are happening in the brain. Hmm. Um, and that's great because brain structure and function are deeply related. So if we know where something is, we can draw conclusions about what it is also and like what kind of processes it's drawing on. Um, fMRI, very good in space, very bad in time. Hmm. So fMRI is the signal we're getting in fMRI is the relative levels of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood. So hmm. we're a couple steps away from like actual neural activity. We're using like something that correlates with what looks like local field potentials. And so the theoretical resolution is never going to be higher than the capillaries because we're using a blood-based signal to draw inferences about neural activity. Um, that's a con. The pros are that you can do this in a living brain. It's non-invasive and you can get pretty good spatial resolution and okay temporal resolution. If you want really high temporal resolution, um, you can go with EEG, uh, and then MEG um, kind of tries to do both. Um, if you combine EEG and MEG, you get better spatial resolution on your EEG. And EEG also involves thinking of the brain in a different way than, in my opinion, a lot of people who do fMRI think about the brain. Um, EEG people tend to end up in a, in a place where they're thinking about the brain as a set of interacting oscillatory uh, waves, mm. because that's what EEG shows you. Um, and fMRI people tend to think about the brain as kind of um, flexible nodes in a network, mm. because that's what fMRI shows you. So, you know, I don't know if that's a, which way the direction of causality goes there, but that's that's uh, that's a thing. So, and there are newer types of brain imaging. There's FNIRS, for example, um, which uses light to do brain imaging. And 
that's really cool for a lot of reasons. It's portable, it's less expensive. You don't need a giant room with a giant, you know, millions of dollars worth of magnet in it to do FNIRs. Um, but FNIRs also uh, only get to kind of the cortical surface. And for whatever reason, a lot of these structures that are implicated in meditation are deeper in the brain. So in order to get these deeper structures, um, we need an imaging method that's going to be able to see them. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. <clears throat> Um, okay, here's the hard question. Uh, uh, let's see. Fast forward to the end of your life, and you're on your <laughs> deathbed, and you've done, I don't know, say 50 years of neuroscientific research on meditation between now and then. Uh, and you've just like succeeded beyond your wildest dreams at advancing the study of neuroscience and meditation in the areas you're interested in. What would you love to see happen or what would have happened in those 50 years? Well, the state of the world, like say 50 years from now, if I am just like dying happy, mm -hmm. um, anyone who wants to meditate can with a community and in a way that is going to align with their own goals. Um, they're going to have a place where they can do that, which is going to help them um, match their motivation and interest in having a practice with a practice and a community that's going to work with them. And then when they outgrow that practice, they have a place to go next uh, to be able to find like the next thing that's going to help them. Mm. Um, and that is like, that's like the, um, on the individual level, I think just to get like a little, the question's a little grandiose, so I'm going to get a little grandiose in response. Wonderful. Um, wonderful. Perfect. I think the more people who do that on the individual level, the more that the, um, sort of systems that they're participating in are going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that seems to, you know, we don't, we haven't measured this yet, but one of the things that seems to happen as people get further and further along in their practice is they decentralize um, their, it gets harder and harder to attempt to achieve your own goals at the expense of others, like as you go along. Um, people seem to zoom out and start seeing themselves as parts, small parts of a big system that they're participating in. Um, and the more people who begin to think that way, uh, I think the the less like the less likely you are to engage in behaviors that are to the benefit of yourself and to the detriment of others. And that kind of effect, you know, I mean, just to like, okay, yeah, just to like to go as grandiose and ridiculous as possible, that solves things like like climate change, you know. So this from this small thing of everyone being able to find the practice in the community that works for them, um, that will slowly start to to move out and change the systems that they're that they're a part of. Mm. Yeah. And I mean the other thing that having this practice has done for me, and I see this in others, is just expands the sense of what's possible. Mm. Um, like there's a way in which uh, I feel like my own mind and the mind of my meditating friends has been less and less constrained by um, illusory constraints of what's expected or what's what's usually done or um, or what's possible. And so with like a strong sense of connectedness to a, a, a culture or to a system of humans or to, um, you know, to the planet, and then an expanded sense of what's possible with that grounding and then that expansion, um, there's like incredible potential mm. for the world to be very different. Mm. Yeah. I love that and um, definitely resonate with that. And w what would you like to do in your own career between now and then with neuroscientific research on meditation that might help bring that about? Yeah. Assuming you would succeed, you're like, okay, I'm going to set out and do this. Like, I'm going to succeed. This is where we're going. Like, what would you like to do? Yeah. A part of it is what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, but my big picture vision, and uh, I've been holding this vision for, for a few years, is to be able to establish a um, retreat center 
that is also a research center. Mm. And to be able to draw from practitioners across all different traditions and modes of practice and even some things that like, you know, like psychological workshops, like anything that's sort of involved in moving people towards um, a greater sense of well-being, I guess, and greater agency. Um, and be able to have people come there and do their practices, but also be able to acquire data on them while they're there. And there are a few phases of that. There's getting the data to, like I said, to make the maps. And then there's being able to use the maps in order to allow people to calibrate and then reach their own goals um, in a way that's sort of, I don't want to say more efficient, but I'm going to say in a way that's smoother. Um, one thing I didn't mention about my my own personal story was that I spent I spent many years in what Shenzhen calls the the pit of the void, um, mm. and I part of the reason that happened I think is I got several like big insights into emptiness without corresponding grounding in community or in any kind of Ram Vihara practice, um, and I just kind of slipped. Uh, into a mode that was like very unpleasant for many, many years. And I learned a lot there and I think it increased my capacity to help others, but also like I could have probably learned what I learned in like three months and then moved on, you know, instead of just getting stuck there for, for years and years. And um, there's also a sense almost of urgency. Uh, like the planet is in some trouble <laughs> and um, people having a shorter path to, and I'm not going to say what the right insights are or what the right growth trajectory is, but just a shorter path to kind of um, move outside of the goals and concerns of the tiny mammal um, that we all are and into a kind of greater uh, sense of identification with something larger. Um, the faster we can do that, the better the outcome will be for humanity. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so yeah, being able to match people like it's possible someone comes to the center for like, a, you know, a 10 day silent sitting meditation retreat. And then we take a look at them. We're like, hey, you know, like no pressure, but have you tried five rhythms? Like mm. this actually you kind of look like a five rhythms practitioner. And that could save, you know, just that one suggestion could save them like 10 years of faffing around, sitting <sighs> in the cushion in silence when like they could they could really be like doing something, you uh -huh. know. Um, and so just being able to, I mean, in the same way that you know, I mean, career matching could certainly be improved, but in the same way that you sort of have a sense of what's possible and a sense of what your skill set is and a sense of where you want to go, and then you sort of start and figure it out. We don't have that for practice yet. People are just kind of wandering around in the dark, and um, you end up making progress based on, like, a lot of it is just good luck. <laughs> so... So establishing that center, which will be the first of its kind, but I hope there are I hope there are more of them, um, where people can come and do deep practice and also contribute to science simultaneously, and having a scientific community there that is also bringing um, the scientific mindset to iterating on practice experience and kind of bringing those. So I mean. That's what I've been doing with my life is just bringing these worlds closer and closer together. And I just want to continue to do that and increase the amount of people who I can help. Beautiful. Yeah. In your own story, when you were experiencing that difficult period, what helped you to get out? I don't really know. Mm. Um, so there are several things that happened. I had like... Uh, some like personal difficulty, like some relationships ended um, and that was really challenging. And so as a way of navigating that, um, I was sitting slightly more retreats than usual. And I was I was working at the Martino Center and I had sat a three day retreat and then went back to work. And it was like a week later or something. I left my desk 
to walk and get a coffee. Um, and, and this is in Boston, and I passed these two construction workers like wearing hard hats and just like ripping on each other because that's how you express affection in Boston. Um, <laughs> and, and I was just walking past them and this thing just flipped over. It was, there was just this complete understanding that these two construction workers talking to each other was like love using love to communicate with itself. Hmm. And everything was different after that. Hmm. And like, I don't know how the hell you recreate that experience because mm -hmm. I don't know, like all these threads had to come together in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. But I also know that there had to have been some kind of biological correlate that happened in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like there is something about that that we can't understand. Mm -hmm. And the understanding of it doesn't actually, it doesn't rob it of its significance. It imbues it with even more significance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, just good luck. Like uh -huh. I was just feeling around in the dark and then like some, something happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How would you describe how you see things now? Like to someone, because I, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about with like love talking to love or like what, what is, what is. Well, this is all like... too like, it's like words super yeah. on an experience that yeah. was incredibly visceral felt a lot like um, what Shinzen calls the wisdom function and like a deep insight, like all kind of converging in mm. one thing. Um, mm. And it didn't really change my like personal metaphysics at all. Like I don't feel like I have to like write down a belief system about it, but it completely changed the way that um, I functioned in the world for a little while in the sense that it just increased the level of trust that I had that um, the world was safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that fit into your sensibilities about um, what you were describing before with like being, you know, these tiny mammals and yet the planet's in trouble and like you want to have a broader impact? Like how does that fit into your sensibilities about the larger human and environmental situation. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in that situation, I am doing what I can in a big group of people who are all doing what they can. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. And there are people who are doing, you know, existential risk stuff and effective altruism stuff and like, you know, using their own expertise in their own ways to affect change around themselves. And you know, I used to think everyone should meditate. I don't think that anymore. Yeah. I talk to some people who are in existential risk who think everyone should be doing existential risk. And I talk to other people who are a little bit more um, of the view that like they have a certain expertise and so they're applying that expertise. And yeah. I think I'm much more of that latter view. Like I have acquired a bunch of expertise about a particular thing and I'm trying to now fold that expertise into something that I hope will be beneficial or mm -hmm. I at least I can I think I'm fairly confident that I'm at least not doing more harm mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hope that I can help mm -hmm. um, I think the moment you start thinking that you know what other people should be doing is the moment that you start risking um, actually doing some harm mm -hmm. and so it's important to me that I'm not like out there kind of pulling people who have no interest in meditation into this. Um, I think it's really important that people come to these practices for their own reasons. Um, and, but once they're, once they're interested, uh, helping them to get the most they possibly can out of it seems really fulfilling. Mm. Yeah. Reminds me of a sort of way of seeing that I often inhabit. It's not like a, proof but just something that like motivates and clarifies things for me which is uh like everyone who's alive has a piece of the puzzle yeah yeah yeah, yeah totally mm. yeah and um you talked about this vision or direction of like having a, a center that has both deep practice and scientific research and that being a like kind of vehicle towards this this larger uh 
possibility that I <laughs> prodded you towards. Um, I know that one of the things you've done as well as like, especially in the last few years has been like being pretty heavily involved in communities of practice and in particular, like supporting them. What, 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 what is your kind of history been with that? And where are you now with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I went from not having any practice community to being in a leadership position in one, like pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so let's see. I started sitting at Against the Stream because Michael Taft was teaching there. And then Against the Stream uh, had um, several uh, organizations, like the, the one organization had several chapters in a bunch of different cities. And one of the things that was refreshing to me about that org was they were, they were kind of like, there was no particular way that you had to be to be there. Mm -hmm. um, they were founded on a kind of like Gen X punk uh, a lot of tattoos and just it was like totally my opposite experience of other kind of places I had tried to go sit where there's like robes and everyone's very calm and mm. you know, um, and I found that really refreshing. Uh, so I came in the door because Taft was there um, and then I kind of stayed because of the community and the org was based in LA and it folded um, in with very little notice uh, in 2018. And I talked about this, I talk about the origin story of this a lot more um, on Buddhist Geeks. Hmm. Um, but when it folded, a bunch of the chapters did a bunch of different things. Um, and the San Francisco chapter did something that is super cool. Uh, they flipped the typical hierarchy of a meditation center and the students took over the lease and started running the center. Hmm. Um, and these, like, so I should say, Against the Stream uh, was started by someone who used Buddhist principles and practice to overcome addiction. And so a huge, I'm not in recovery, but a huge element of that community is in recovery. Mm -hmm. And there's a thing about the recovery community and practice is like, they're super motivated to practice. Mm -hmm. Like, they're practicing like their life is on the line because like it is <laughs> in a lot of ways yeah. and like they sort of understand that yeah. um and so there was like a fire uh in that community to keep going which was really cool and really infectious and still is um really cool and really infectious and it's a lot of people who like don't have another place to go like don't have a car so couldn't drive to spirit rock even like a lot of the people came in on foot um, and like, this was like literally like a refuge. Um, and so the students took it over, became a collective. And I actually started contributing by just running the Facebook page. Uh, that was, that was my, that was my job. I would mm -hmm. run the, I ran the Facebook page and made Facebook events. And I ended up, by the time I left, I was the president, uh, of the org. Mm -hmm. Um, and over the course of those couple of years, you know, we, we did things that that community had never done before. You know, we got together, we made a board, we incorporated as a nonprofit, we recruited new teachers, um, all done in a way like as a collective. And I'd been in that sangha at that point for it was like five five months, uh, but a lot of people had been practicing there for years and years and years and had like really deep history in the in the community. Um, and then over COVID, we went. We went entirely online and that was great for me because by that time I was I was over at Harvard. So I was back in Boston and I was kind of trying to um, help run things remotely. And then in July 2021, um, and at that point, yeah, the Dharma Collective was still entirely online, um, but I got uh, promoted to, to faculty out, out of, I was a postdoc before and then I was faculty. Um, and that combined with uh, our our board terms were expiring that month anyway. So I left in July 2021 and the Dharma Collective is still going. Uh, they just got a new space. They're on 24th in the mission and like they're they're still doing it. I'm super psyched uh, for them. I'm now in the East Bay, so it's a lot harder to get over to the city, but I'll pop in and see how they're doing one of these one of these days. So that was really interesting for me because I had these few months of sitting at against the stream realizing how important other people were peers uh, for my practice, just being able to talk with peers about practice. And then I ended up in a position where 
I was doing um, a good amount of the programming there. So then I got to start talking to teachers about their practice. And it was an incredible gift to be in that position um, at that point. At that point, I've been, I'd already been practicing for, let's see, I've been sitting for like 20 years now. So I'd already been practicing for like 15, 15, 16 years at that point. So I had like a good amount of practice under my belt, but there's no better way to see like, there's definitely not one right way to do this mm. than to talk to several teachers across all different traditions and see them flourishing in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, so it just really kind of clarified for me, like, yeah, these are there's something good in all of these different different traditions. Mm -hmm. So, so that was the beginning, um, and now uh, starting a new practice community with with Michael Taft and Eric Davis called the Alembic. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What what are your hopes with with the Alembic? Sure. So. So we're sort of organized around three um, like pillars, uh, we're doing meditation, psychedelics, and neuroscience. Mm. Um, One and for each of you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. The founding team makes a lot of sense uh, yeah. in this particular org. And then woven throughout all of that, we want to have a strong thread of the creative and the imaginal. So we're going to be doing like visionary art uh, workshops and uh, dance and we really want to bring the kind of creativity into the whole mm. to the whole picture mm. yeah and uh, yeah Go no ahead. please okay um, well the one other thing I was gonna say is it's really important uh, to all of us that we're drawing from several different traditions um, so it's really easy in the East Bay in particular to find um, like Buddhist communities um, or like other sort of smaller communities. And what can happen there is um, you can get really like monocultural in your practice community. And there can be a whole, you know, set of norms and rules and social structures that are um, not expansive. And so we want to be a kind of um, a meeting point for a lot of different practice communities. And someone the other day used the metaphor of mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not crazy about that because I don't, we're not pitting them against each other. Like they're, they're all good. Um, but more that I want the different like wisdom traditions and ways of knowing and modes of knowing and ways of being that are represented in all these different practice communities to be able to interact and like resonate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we want that to be happening here. So we have, we have three different practice rooms and then a few lounges. So we're going to be able to have like, um, you know, Eric Davis is going to have like a small group of people who are like reading a text mm -hmm. together, doing like a close read of some text. And simultaneously, there'll be like five rhythms going on in this room. And then those people will be exiting through the same lobby and able to interact with each other and kind of compare notes and mm -hmm. talk to one another. Um, yeah. And so I'm just really excited to see what comes out of this place. Totally. Yeah. I love hearing you talk about it now. And we also got a chance to talk about it at Vibe Camp, which we were both at. And yeah. I was just thrilled to talk to you because... Um, one of the dreams that I've had for a while is like building a dance club and, um, yes. you know, the way that I would love to run events is, which, you know, I, I, I did my first version of this at Five Camp, which was great. And it was like, oh, this could be so much better. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, I would love to have like one room where it's like a meditation room and there's like cushions and you can give a talk and it's like, here's what Meta is and let's do a practice. And are there any questions? And then, okay, now we're going to like get up and go in a different room and it's going to be an actual dance room and there'll be a sound system and there's like lights and um we're still doing meta different room same practice but like now we're dancing and now there's awesome music and it it sounds like that might be possible at the olympics so i'm, I mean, I'm really yeah, excited we should do that here yeah. like we can literally do that here <laughs> yeah yeah so uh i'm excited to come visit and check it out and also just really a big fan of the project and what you're up to and um yeah i love i love to see as well like the in general the sort of trend of I mean, I imagine it was really lonely for you these years where you didn't have a community and then you like 
you know, you're at against the stream and then that falls apart and then it's yeah. the Dharma Collective and now you're starting the Olympic and you're just like going for it, you know? Uh, so I love to see that and like see you thriving and like having community, but also like giving back and, uh, yeah. you know, building community yourself. So that's really beautiful to see. Yeah. Thanks, Sashin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel seen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I mean, speaking of, like I was saying, you know, people in recovery practice like their hair's on fire. And I, <laughs> I sort of, I have that sense of the importance of community because I didn't have it for the first 15 years I was sitting. Totally. And, um, and being able to like just provide a space for that. I mean, that's what, for me personally, with this center, I feel like I'm building the place that I needed when I was 20. Hmm. Um, like if I could have walked into this place, uh, it would have been like, it would have alleviated so much suffering hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to, to give that back to like this former version of myself is incredibly rewarding. And then just being able to see community grow around like, you know, <sighs> There are so many different ways to look at practice, but one way to look at it is we just have the same weird hobby. Like mm. we're just doing something that's like really weird. Our idea of fun is to that. like get on a plane and then fly somewhere and then sit in a house with strangers for three weeks in total silence, you know, and then get back on a plane and leave. And like that's, <laughs> you know, I didn't even realize that was weird until I was- Where am I going? When do I, when do I- Yeah, like I, I did this over? fire casino retreat and I was telling one of my grad school friends about it and she was like, wait, you haven't even met most of them before? <laughs> and I was like, oh, right, this is super weird. This is a uh -huh. weird thing to do. Um, and just being able to have a group of people around you who are just into the same weird thing you are, um, never mind like all the other levels of like psychological well-being and spiritual fulfillment that, that people get out of, out of this, but just to be able to have people who have your same weird hobby mm. and to get to talk with them like that's incredibly valuable. Mm. Yeah. And then okay. I happen to think that this is like the coolest weird hobby to have. Uh, so being able to be part of this community while also being able to steward it is just like, it's, 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 it's incredible. It's an incredible privilege. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we've covered a ton of territory, uh, you know, sort of more from an interview side. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about more in conversation? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it was actually really hard not to be allowed to like ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> all time. I'm not used to like, talking for that long. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious, just first of all, like here we are on this podcast, mm -hmm. and I talked a little bit about my vision for the retreat center and the research center, but I'm curious to hear about your vision for the podcast. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um... Hmm. You know, it's been, uh, I've had the podcast now for about a year and uh, done, I don't know how many, maybe like 60 episodes or something like that, and uh, which is pretty, pretty good clip. Um, and, uh, you know, at first it just was like, oh, this seems like a, I, I was, I was in a period of kind of transition. I was leaving the monastic training for the second time. And I was like, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do next. So probably I should start a podcast because, uh, and the way I thought of it was um, actually just like, oh, I'm going to be having a lot of conversations anyway, so I might as well record them. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking to a lot of people, like, kind of learning what's happening in the world. And probably that's of use to people to record that and um, put it out there. And uh, so I started doing that. And um, I think uh, broadly how I think of my time now is and this took some time to figure out, but is, is like, there's sort of two endeavors that I'm doing. One is spreading love and kindness, which involves teaching it, but also, you know, like inspiring people to practice it. That's where like things like dance parties fit in or the music video that I put out recently. Yeah, um, I saw that. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really proud of it. And uh, yeah, so there's loving kindness stuff. And then there's stuff that's like related to, I'd say broadly, my curiosity. So the podcast fits into that. Like, I don't... Um, it's so open-ended, you know, I, I uh, very lazily put on the description for the podcast for some of the places like Tashin talks to interesting people about interesting things. You know? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what this thing is. Like, here you go. If you want to listen to this, you can. And it's like, well, I know I'm interested in you. I know I'm interested in the other people that I talk to. Uh, I don't 
necessarily have some big story about why, but it's like, oh, this this is an interesting person doing interesting things that I want to learn about. So let me talk to them and figure out um, what they're about. And um, that's that's been useful for my own sort of education, I'd say. Like I learn a lot from people. Um, you know, like by the end of this conversation, I know more about neuroscientific research on meditation than I did at the beginning. It's like, that's great. I'm curious about that. So now I know a little more about that. Um, and uh, mm, but ideally, I think over time, it's become more clear to me that I want to be talking to people that have um, some kind of service project, basically, mm. um, very broadly conceived. It's not like, oh, they need to be running a soup kitchen or something. This is always the metaphor that comes to mind, because in, when I was in middle school, I volunteered at like a... Um, uh, at like a food bank, which uh, my mom has been very involved in food banks for many years. And I think that's great. And I remember being bored out of my mind, just like, <laughs> oh, why am I doing this? I just want to go home and do, I don't even want to do my homework, but that would be better. Uh, you know, it's like, this is good, but I don't want to be here. And, um, you know, sort of in my own little world. And I, I don't want that to be the the vibes associated with service of like, oh, you're doing something you don't actually want to be doing but mm -hmm. it's like there are actually people like yourself that are like deeply internally motivated to do this thing for the world and it could be anything it could be like what you're doing it could be making art you know i've had artists on the show um that i think somehow their art like really touches the world in a certain way or you know some other kind of service project and and i want to learn about what these people are doing and i want to um give them a platform to like really um show what they're doing from a perspective of who they are and where they're coming from. Yeah. That's cool. That is really cool. I have a, I have an edgier question actually mm -hmm. that just came up while you were answering that. So what is it like for you to kind of, you're developing kind of a brand as like the loving kindness guy. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm, I'm wondering what that's like if you like get angry um, mm -hmm. and you know, how, how does that sit with you in terms of like the, the loving kindness, like, practice and then also if you can't like if you can't live up to that all the time how how is that for you hmm oh that's a great question uh thanks for asking i, I feel really seen by that as well because um yeah I, I imagine that from like knowing so many teachers through the you know the community projects you've done in the past few years you've seen like people are people you know they may have uh this is something that took me a long time to learn because i was just in one environment my teacher i mean my teacher is amazing like i love my teacher still and it took me a long time to figure out oh this is just a guy like he's a great guy he's amazing i can learn a lot from him and he's a guy uh, um so i'm also a guy uh, uh, that's hopefully more obvious to everyone in the world than it was to me with my teacher but um Anyway, I, I feel, you know, that's important. So um, I also I also really don't want to, I don't hold myself as a teacher, um, in, if only because of some like recovering wounds really about how I held the student teacher relationship. But it's mm -hmm. like the thing I was doing, I don't want to, I don't want that. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a student with another teacher and I don't want to be that kind of teacher for someone else. So the way I hold it is like, hey, there's this technique or suite of techniques that have been very important to me, very helpful for me. I think they're great. I don't think they're that taught that well in general. I think I can do better at, at sharing them. Um, and if someone wants to learn those techniques, here you go. Here's a bunch of guided meditations. I do a meditation once a week. Come, it's half an hour. You know, it's not like a, a church or something. Um, sure. sure. Uh, but yeah, I think I've done those techniques a bunch. They've had impacts on my mind. It feels easier to feel love for myself and others. It feels easier to like manifest that in my presence and my actions and my words, the way I see the world. I try to do that as much as I can. That feels like a pretty important core value at this point of like, especially because I've really gotten interested in how the way I see it now, like there's no limit to how much love it's possible to feel or express. Yeah. And like, I just want to, I just want to go way down that road, you know, like it's every step I take is like way better. So for me, for everybody, like, um, uh, so I want to keep going. Um, and, uh, you know, I've only gone so far. And in, in fact, like some of my heroes certainly have gone way farther down that road. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, there's all kinds of things that come up where it's like, 
I would like to embody that virtue as much as possible. And I don't know, yeah, I get angry, I get depressed. Um, I have difficult interpersonal problems. Uh, um, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. And I, I guess, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't experience too much conflict with that. I think like I understand myself to be just a guy with problems and I, it's, I, it's, at least so far people haven't projected too much otherwise on me. I think um, there are some things that I would be wary of, of like one, like an expectation that I'd be happy all the time. I'm not happy <laughs> all the time. You know, I know reliably how to become happy, but that doesn't mean I am happy all the time, at least right now. Maybe, maybe I'll get there. I don't know. Uh, but I'm not now, and that's fine. And um, um, the other one would be, I think that there are aspects of my personality as I understand myself, you know, kind of kind of like from a parts work perspective, mm -hmm. um, that I've really come to peace with internally, but I'm still working out how to express publicly. And um, uh, one of them would be around sexuality, and one would be kind of around what I would describe as like darkness or, um, mm. or maybe even just masculinity. I'm thinking about this after a conversation I had on the podcast yesterday. Um, but kind of like, that's like, that's a different frame than the frame I'm in when I'm in like in my love and light mode, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. it's like, how do I integrate all that? It's tricky because certainly with sexuality, it's like their ethical questions of like, how do you ethically be a sexual person in the world? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm work. I, I, you know, I've come to some peace with that, working on it, but still, especially communicating that, how to communicate that, express that, be be transparent about that is is sometimes tricky. And yeah, anyway, I think that would be another thing if I felt like there were aspects of my personality that I wasn't able to express um, or that weren't being seen or accepted. That that might be hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially like if you were if you were actually doing that to yourself, like if there were parts of yourself, your internal experience that felt like you were trying to gloss over, like that would be, yeah, that would be really challenging. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've really, um, I mean, there's still work to be done, but I've come to a lot of peace around those parts internally. And, and as I say, the, the hard part is how to express them and how, uh, when and, and in what way so that it doesn't, doesn't hurt people or offend people or something like that. Um, I, I think I could probably be like, a hundred times more sexual publicly and like 10 times like darker or like more masculine or whatever oh, publicly. Oh, interesting. So the darkness is actually edgier for you. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know about that. I, I, I just only can see so far of like how much I could express it more. Yeah. Uh, I, um, they both seem kind of difficult to express publicly, but yeah. I don't know if one's edgier than the other, but yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It was the, that was really fun to listen to you uh, talk about. Mm. I love what you said about there's no limit to the amount of love that can be experienced. That's mm -hmm. been true in my experience too. And like felt so or expressed. Many, yeah, or expressed. Yeah. Yes. And so like so many things in the in the path of practice, it feels like there's it's almost just like every time you hit a new local maximum, you can see ones that you couldn't see before. It's like totally. peaks beyond peaks, mountains beyond mountains. Yeah. Totally. Um, and being able to just keep keep going. Like that's one thing I didn't I didn't mention. Um, oh, I'm curious how you think about this too. Like when I was younger, I had this like crazy single pointed drive towards what I was thinking of as enlightenment back mm. then. And there's something in that that has relaxed that has looked like i now look at things as much more of a process and like an unfolding rather totally. than a digital event that is going to go like a turnstile mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. and then everything will be like different forever um and yeah i'm curious how you think about that like what do you think about the like awakening process hmm great question um before I answer that, I'd be curious just to hear like what shifted for you such that you see it as a process or like how you see that now exactly. Hear I more about don't that. remember when it shifted. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I definitely like, I remember sitting retreats where I came into the retreats really motivated and still in that frame of mind. Mm -hmm. And when I sat the fire casino retreat like i can't that was a three-week retreat right at the beginning of covid um uh so wow. 
yeah, it was an interesting time to be on retreat. It was like February 20th to March 16th, mm -hmm. um, 2020. And coming out of that retreat, I was still on fire about practice, but it felt like in a kind of different way where now what had been like really aimed at a goal was now instead very invested in the process itself. Mm. Um, and I can't say like, oh, that's where it shifted, but because everything shifted right then, right? That was March, 2020. So like everything changed uh, and it's hard to know what to point to. But now this practice feels like it's much more of like a, a creative artistic expression and something that I do because it has a lot of value to me and it feels a lot less um, eh, goal directed, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I'm happy for you. Cause I don't know, especially like having this conversation, like, um, um, how to put this. So I don't know what awakening is. Different mm -hmm. people mean a lot of different things by it. There are certain things that I've learned to watch for. And like, of course, I, I would never make a claim about your experience, but like you seem very alive and very clear and very calm and centered and um, also like in integrity with your values and like have a clear vision for how you want to show up in the world. And and so for me, like at this point in my life, um, I'm really sensitive to that with other people of like, oh, you know, because there are people that that aren't those things where they're like suffering. You look at their faces and they're like tight and like they're really hurting and then they hurt other people around them and like they aren't really going somewhere in their lives and they're kind of have all kinds of emotions that are just getting in the way of them and each other. And like um, that, that I mean, I have compassion for those people. It's like that's not that's that's like metaphorically a hell realm to be in. Like it, you can go way down that spectrum of just insanity basically if you take it to the extreme and um that's that's suffering and and then there's people that are like seem to be more and more in the other one of like the kinds of the qualities that i was just talking about um and you can see it in people's faces and you can see it in how they spend their days and what they're working towards and um i'm interested in people and helping people that are you know really alive that are they're very alive that are doing something with their skills and their perspective that seems to be helping other people. And um, so you seem very that, you know, like that's, that's like, that's, that feels like, you know, we were talking about these axes earlier. It's like that. I don't even know about the awakening thing. Like, I don't know. That was a, a source of huge conflict for me in many years. Like everybody talks about this so differently yeah. and like different yeah. traditions talk about it. I, I, I just gave up on that. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I look at you and I'm like, Oh, you, you seem to be doing good. And I look at me, <laughs> And I seem to be doing good. It's like, I don't, I don't think I'm awakened by any of those things. You know, like I don't, you know, if I, if you, there are certain teachers that I really respect, I bet you, if you put me in a room with them, they'd be like, no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, I don't know. But like for me in my own sense making, I'm like, this is good. I'm happy. I have things that I'm working on that I enjoy that are helping other people. Like, let's keep doing this. This seems to be good. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I see things these days. Yeah, I do think, yeah, I mean, maybe that's another axis that we should have put on there is like, mm -hmm. how much uh, suffering are you opting into, mm -hmm. knowingly or unknowingly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that's another thing I wish I could tell my younger self is like, all this, like, a lot of this is optional, like mm -hmm. you're doing this and, you know, and it's not, it's not your fault, uh, but you are, there is like some aspect of you that's choosing to do this like proliferation of suffering and totally. there is like a spectrum maybe of just like seeing that as optional and then opting out <laughs> can you go back and tell my younger self that too right? yeah <laughs> I, could, I don't know i think that's what they were trying to say all along but it took me a while to hear that yeah exactly <laughs> you have to hear it a zillion times if you're mean <laughs> me too me too for sure yeah uh, you have to join a monastery, leave a monastery, rejoin the monastery, and then leave again. And then maybe you'll hear it. Uh, I was a trouble case. <laughs> yeah. You just took the, you know, the advanced coursework. <laughs> advanced coursework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's that's a euphemism if I ever heard one. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anything else that you'd like to talk about while we're still talking? 
Well, Tasha, I feel like we could talk for hours and hours, but it's been, it's been a while. Yeah, totally, so totally. I think, I think this is a good point to say uh, until next time. Wonderful. Yeah, let's do it yeah. again sometime. And thanks yeah. so much for talking with me, Katie. Likewise. <laughs>